Welcome to Autism ADHD TV. It is the place to be for parents and professionals. I'm your host, Holly Blanc Moses, the mom psychologist who gets it. We dive into all kinds of important information like behavior, social skills, and learning. All right, let's get started. Welcome, Dr. Maureen O'Shaughnessy. I'm so excited you're here today. Holly, it is so great to be here. Thank you. So I'm going to introduce you to everyone. Maureen is on a mission to connect the dots between education, belonging, and youth empowerment. As the founder of the Human Centered Microschool, lead prep author of Creating Microschools for Colorful Mismatched Kids, host of the Education Evolution podcast, and co-founder of the Ed Active Collective, she is disrupting the outdated education system. I feel like I need a drum roll <laughs> after that. That's so, so amazing. Um, we often find ourselves, teachers, parents, therapists, in this sort of strange situation where we have this typical school environment and this typical school curriculum, yet we have, like you said, these mismatched kids, like they, they it, it's not built for them. So we're kind of stuck in this strange place where we've got everything set up in a certain way, but then our children and our students and our clients, what do we do? How do we support them in these environments that may maybe not built for built for the way they are? Uh, that is such a tough question. And I raised my daughters overseas and brought them back to the US for high school. So they'd have lots of options in their native language. And we tried six or seven different models between my two girls. So I couldn't make it work for them. And I'm a school principal, school head. So I ended up saying, forget it. I'm starting my own school to help other kids that were like my daughters. So I couldn't quite make it work. But there are like three main things parents can do. One is really know and honor who your kid is. When we say, no, 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 sweetie, you have to be a square peg because this is a square hole. Come on. That that's just demoralizing. And, and sometimes we feel like we have to conform and that every other family has it perfectly together, but ours, which is so not true. They just on the surface may look like they do, but first don't force our kids to be something they're not. No, your kid does not want to run cross country just because you did, you know, don't, don't, don't let our kids be who they are and really spend time getting to know who they are. And the second is play to strengths. What are their passions? How can you, hey, let's get you in that woodshop elective or you know what, school's kind of a drag. We're gonna stick with it, but just pass. I don't think it's really worth your time to have three hours of memorization every night. Let's do what it takes to pass. And then outside of school, do you wanna do Aikido? Do you want to take a cooking class with me? Do you just want time to do gaming with your friends? So play to their strengths and let the rest just be. I am a just be cook. I am a just to be housekeeper. There are things I just do what it takes to be minimal. And then there are other things like my school where I am like over the top. We need to let our kids be that too. So don't force them to be what they aren't, play to their strengths. And then we need to remember our voices as parents. We have voices, we have options, but we have to speak up and we have to engage the school and say, my child needs this, 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 how can this happen? Not can this happen, but how will you make this happen? My child has too much homework. My child is, and if they can't, you need to start thinking, am I willing to go through this system, middle school, high school for seven years? Am I willing to have my child go through the system that doesn't work for them? And if not, there are options. It's not always easy. It's not always pleasant, but we've got to let our kids be themselves, play to their strengths, and we have to find our voices as parents. You hit on about a hundred important things <laughs> <laughs> while you were talking. I was just like, yes, 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 yes. Um, I think there is this pressure. There is this pressure for parents and really teachers too, is this mold, right? We have to fit into this mold. This is what the expectation is by somebody somewhere at some time made up this expectation. Yep. 
Right. And, and it was based on convenience. They say over a hundred years ago, the order that science is taught in high school, the, the scientists just kind of said, well, let's just go alphabetical. So let's do biology the first year, chemistry the next, and then physics. Yeah, and a lot of it was based on, you know, here's what kids need to kind of have a knowledge of before we had smartphones where, hey, you need to know, you know, what this equation is, you look it up. And so we need to be shifting from what was back before we had easy access to content to how to apply that content. And we need to be doing project-based learning, real world learning, passion projects, internships. So kids learn how to apply, how to connect with each other, use their social skills. And they start to figure out, wow, I love animals, but oh, when I did my internship in that vet office, my older daughter did this. I felt sad because the animals were hurting when they came in, they were scared. I don't want to work in a vet office, even though I love animals. So we need to give them real world so they get the connections and it's relevant and they can start to learn where might I want to serve after high school. Exactly. So not looking at it as fighting this broken system over and over again. It's what can we do to move forward? So I think sometimes parents feel really frustrated with schools. I know teachers feel really frustrated too in trying to figure out how to make all this work. Like you said, there are ways, but we have to be open to it. We have to look at things with a different lens. It's easy to, again, get stuck in this idea where this is how we do things. It's always how we've done things. Mm -hmm. We need to take a differently wired child and, like you said, expect them to be something they're not. And that's where we see depression and anxiety and masking. Yes. And that's so sad. And, And yes, public schools have to do state testing. That's how they get their funding. I've had parents say, then I'm going to tap into their college 529 and put them in your micro school so they can have project-based learning and they're not prepping for tests half of the school year. And they're like, I didn't plan on using their college funds for high school, but this kid's not going to make it through high school if they feel so beleaguered and beaten up and like getting through school every day is survival. So you might have to make some choices. I wish... I had known more options when I returned to the U.S., but I was kind of out of touch having been overseas for so long. Um, Through my podcast, I've learned about big picture learning schools, which are a part of public schools, P-TECH schools, which are in a lot of schools. And and big picture learning is super project and passion-based. You know, there are models out there. P-TECH takes kids all the way through from ninth grade to the first two years of community college, no matter where they are. So you can be really struggling in math. They catch you up. They have mentors. They have paid internships. So there are some free public school options and some really cool private school options. So we just need to keep looking and not force our kids to fit a system that is super demoralizing. If it's not the right fit, it's not the right fit. Right. And if you feel like you are in a place where you don't have a lot of options, because sometimes that can happen. Mm -hmm. If you're in a particular state that doesn't have a lot of services or resources or in an area, thinking about how you can get together with the school collaboratively, right? We're going to go in with um, a great attitude as much as we can, because I know a lot of teachers and parents have been burned during IEP meetings and 504 meetings, me included, um, but really coming to the table as partners and that child's voice being the loudest. That's exactly what is supposed to happen. Yes. If we see that it's not working for them, let's step back from the try harder. Yes. Right? <laughs> oh my, that's like overseas. If somebody doesn't understand English and we're Americans in another country, when we speak it louder and slower, it's not going to suddenly make them understand English. It's like, oh my gosh, disconnect. And I think those IEP meetings are a super opportunity to be curious. I didn't know because my, my daughter with ADHD autism didn't get diagnosed until sixth grade because we were overseas and small communities kind of just adapted to her, but she got an IEP in 11th grade. And so I was sorting things out at the last minute, that whole world. Um, 
I found out she only had to try the math, state math test once. And if she couldn't get a passing score, they could shift to an alternative math test. She could still get her diploma. So asking, so wait, how does this work for kids with IEPs? None of them get a diploma. And oh, well, there's a plan B. It's like, okay, let's be in line for that. And then they were also helping me when I was like, so what happens after high school? They're like, oh, we're going to have the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation in, in the Seattle area. We're going to get your daughter signed up. And then she'll have, she got a free neuropsych eval when she was 19. She got a, a, a coach when she was in high school to go to Safeway and help her be a customer service clerk and help her which task is most important and how to prioritize. So those meetings, there are so many resources that schools want you to know about. So you've just got to be curious and say, how can this work? What can we do? And I was surprised to, I was pleasantly surprised that there were some resources I'd never heard of, but we've got to collaborate and they're doing the best they can, the teachers within the system they've been given. So it's really got to be a conversation and not confrontational. Right. And as much as we can possibly do that, keeping our, our eyes on the goal and what that child needs and how they need it and how can we adapt? Because I think we have to be really mindful of ourselves. Sometimes conflict comes up if we feel like a child is inflexible, but we have to also be really mindful that we're being very inflexible as well. And that is hard, even as adults, right? I mean, we have like, no, this is the expectation. This is what needs to happen. I think there's always a way, you know, if we put our heads together and we figure it out, maybe there's, maybe there is another option that nobody knew at that IEP table. Well, then who can we ask if we don't have the information for this? You know, what do we do next? And not stopping there too, because really then everyone is educated. And more children are supported and helped in the way that they need. Right. And that's, I love that about my podcast. I keep learning about more options out there. One Stone School in Boise takes kids from all these districts and has all these summer programs and this and that. Even if they have to go back to a traditional high school thing, they have this after school, they have this summer program. It's like, if we can ask enough questions and educate ourselves enough and share that with others, pay it forward, there are options. And if they're not, maybe you're crazy enough to be like I am and say, well, heck, then I'm going to make something happen. <laughs> and I, and I love that you do that. So <laughs> lots of schools come to you. Lots of schools have come to you mm-hmm. for your knowledge and how can they help differently wired children? How can we get their needs met? When we're not maybe built for that. Yeah. We all know small is different. When we're in a small setting, we can really know the students well. And that's the beauty of a lot of alternative schools. I know sometimes they kind of, oh, those are the kids that were like, you know, the ones that might be into drugs or this or that or ooh. But actually, alternative schools have a lot to teach us. They've gone small, first name basis, couches, more projects, and kids feel valued and then they feel safe and then they're willing to learn. I um, got to start a school within a school in a high school that had over 700 kids in each grade when I was a teacher and six of the seven, five of the six periods, the kids came to us and we had project based and integrated and applied math and science, real world business classes. And then they could go take Japanese or drama. They could take something back and benefit from the huge comprehensive high school Schools can do choice schools and schools within schools and break off a little bit and say, hey, we're going to be a hands-on group or we're going to be a techie group. We have the structure. We have teachers with a passion. We need to give them permission, extra planning time and support that. But they've tried and had success in some places, but given up in others to have these schools within schools. But I love that. So to me, that's the no brainer when we're big, it's impersonal and it's assembly line. But then when it's smaller, it's like Rita Pearson's Ted talk, you know, every child deserves a champion when it's smaller, those kids get that champion and like, you like this, you should check out this internship. You like this. Hey, this is going on this weekend. You know, it's just beautiful when it's small, it's community. Oh, so good. Okay. 
So when it feels like there's no way, like you were saying, it could be a bigger school, it's possible. It doesn't have to, you don't have to be overwhelmed who, who, those who are mm-hmm. watching and listening to go out and start your own school. If you want to, kudos, let me know. I want to hear about it. <laughs> let Maureen and I know. We want to support you on that. Yes. Um, but that it doesn't always have to be just that. You've got other options. Like you were saying, you created a school within a larger school. So it was possible. Absolutely. And I'm near the Lake Washington School District in um, east of Seattle, and they have choice schools. And a lot of times they share a campus with a larger school. And so they've got an environmental one, one that's in Latin, one that's a whole huge STEM school, and it's lottery. And the waiting list is a mile long. It's so popular for kids to get to have these smaller opportunities that are specialized. And that's going to start to align with kids' passions and purpose. Environmental, yes, I want to be outdoors. I really love the environment. You know, or STEM, yeah, let me create and let me get into computer science and, and animation and all these cool things. It's huge. I wish that they would have triple the number of those and that every district would have these choice schools where kids can say, that's who I am. That's my tribe. I am willing to put in the work if it's relevant and that school would be relevant. Uh, And I love that you said that too. When you are told to be again, square into a square, square hole, you are not you. And I think we need to remember that as neurotypical people. If somebody came up to us and was like, no, you, you're not supposed to be you. That's wrong. You're supposed to be this and you're supposed to be okay in this environment. You're supposed to be okay with this curriculum. And even though you don't learn that way, too bad, so sad. Mm -hmm. And even though we do have, and thank goodness, IEPs and 504s and accommodations, you know, a lot of times children are not finding that that's enough for them, that they need more, that it's ultimately not working for them. Um, and there is a lot of holes when it comes to education, as far as educating teachers. I mean, they're already overwhelmed, right? right? And then we have educating them about how children are learning and how to possibly adapt the curriculum in a way that would work for them or what would be a good goal and objective and a strategy to meet those goals. Um, so really more education for them as well. Absolutely. And we all are super scared right now. The, the, the power and pressure of social media. We hear stories of eight-year-olds that are anorexic because they feel fat and they don't, and they want to have, you know, plastic surgery and stuff. It's like that conformity into an unrealistic expectation physically schools are doing the same thing. They're saying, you're not good enough, conform to our system. And when you look at that, you would never tell an eight-year-old you're fat and you should, you know, you you should be on such a strict diet that you're anorexic. We would never want them to think that they are not fine naturally the way they physically are. But we say that basically about their academics. Well, you're not at grade level. You're not this, you're not that. So we're beating them up in a whole different realm that's just as demoralizing. So for many, many years, exactly by people they trust or are told they should be able to trust, not just random people out in social media land. So yeah, we've got to stop doing that and let different be okay and honor that, acknowledge that, normalize it. Yes. And how are we going to make this work for you? Because your brain doesn't want to do it this way. What can we do? We've got a problem solve with the kids and the parents. When you brought up that example, I think people are really going to, that's going to get, that's going to hit home with them where that would be outrageous, Mm -hmm. right? This is outrageous yet. We do it. We don't think we're doing it, but we do do it all of the time. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And again, I see often being a psychologist, I see this happen over and over again, where Children will come to me, adolescents, teens, um, even young adults will come to me and they feel like everything they do is wrong. They yes. feel like they fail miserably. Yes. They don't fit in anywhere. They're not accepted. They're alone, even though they are in a sea of other kids. And when you had mentioned too, finding your people, finding your tribe, finding mm. who you feel comfortable with, 
I think when you are passion based and have those projects, you're so much more likely to find people that you have things in common with. Yeah. And willing to invest the time. And, and we don't even realize what a painful experience we're, we're subjecting most kids to. Um, Iowa Big was formed in Cedar Rapids when a bunch of business people shadowed high school kids for a day and they were tormented. It's like, oh my God, it hasn't changed since the 80s when I was there and, and, and we're being talked at. My attention span, I don't like sitting this still. I don't like being this widget going through this assembly line. Heck no, let's support something different. I would love to have more people that are saying our kids need to suck it up, spend a day in a typical high school and see if it really is life giving for them. And if it's really how we want to be treating our kids during such a formative stage. Exactly. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And where do we want our kids to spend the majority of their day? Yeah. And, and how are they going to experience that? Is it going to, like you said, is it going to bring them joy? Is it going to help ignite their passions or will it break them down over and over and over again, every single day? Um, this, the words, again, I mentioned earlier, try harder and should be able to, those are all based on, again, this understanding of what someone said we should be learning and when and how, Mm -hmm. um, and if we're not really paying attention to that, try harder and should, or I know you can, you're choosing not to all these things that usually come up. So when we hear those red flag terms, I would challenge anybody to step back and say, should be because of what? Yeah. Says who and why? Says who? (laughs) Yeah, I know. Right. We get to be rebels. Who says so? Yes. I, Holly, I'm sure you hear this so often in your practice, these kids that are just being pushed and pulled by a system. And yeah, if we can question why, you know, or you know, no, that doesn't fit for my kid. What options could I explore? Exactly. And I think there are so many amazing creative educators out there Mm -hmm. that, you know, we want to challenge you as well, because you are the ones in the schools every single day. You have such great passion and experience that you bring to the table And really wondering what can we do? What can we do to make this different, to make it make more sense, to make it more exciting? Um, And I I think that, again, we're always a work in progress, Mm -hmm. right? But really saying that it's okay to consider something else, to talk about what our options are, like you said. Yeah. And there's so many good things we can steal from elementary schools as a a middle school, high school principal. So how could I get together with a colleague of mine and we could take my English class and his social studies class and have a bigger block with kids so we can start to do projects within that block? Or how could I take my kids and loop and have them again next year? So ninth grade English and then into 10th grade English. So I know them and I can meet them and keep going. And yes, as an administrator, those are master schedule nightmares because when you lock something in everything else has to move around it differently but we lock in the batik class the the japanese class the the one-offs we have to work in how can we maybe get three teachers together and be a school within a school a hub so there are lots of cool things that we can do on a smaller scale how could we flip our classrooms and send home mini lectures and then let the kids process all day instead of us talking at them all day there's a lot of good examples out there of how we can make learning more engaging and more relational. That's really great. And again, listening to the kids, they are the ones that we're supposed to be there for, (laughs) you know, what are, what are they saying? I think that's a really big one. And oftentimes we miss that. We miss that in IEP meetings and 504s. And also, what do you want your learning experience to look like? I mean, ultimately, we say, what do you want to do when you grow up, right? Mm -hmm. Or what does your future look like to you? Well, what does their education look like to them? Um, We don't really ask those kinds of questions usually. Mm -hmm. 
And that also makes me think, Holly, when you say, what do you want to be when you grow up? How in the heck are they going to know if they have textbook, a diet of textbooks for seven years, and then they're like, okay, done. It's like, what? Well, I guess I'll do more textbooks because that's all I know, where if we've let them have hands-on classes and let them create and let them have internships and be mentored in passion projects, they're going to say, well, I thought I'd like that, but I don't really like the office format. I don't want to be in a cubicle. I thought I'd like that, but that's you know more of this. And oh, that, I want to have a landscaping company because that felt so good good. So I need to go to the community college and get this certificate and understand business. But then they're acting out of a place of, you know, they're informed young adults making their next step and not just like, I guess I'll go to the state college that my cousin goes to. I don't know, which is just student loan debt and a disaster. And a lot of brains aren't ready for college at 18. Some aren't ready or don't need it ever, but we kind of feel like that's the should. Path the should. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, says who? (laughs) (laughs) I love that. I think we're going to get t-shirts that says, says who? Yeah. Let's do that, Holly. (laughs) And I want to know the answer, Yeah, you know? So I, I think that's fantastic. And we, we've been telling our boys, you know, it's about what you want to get up in the morning and do that you love. Mm-hmm. It's not about trying to go to this college where you think you're supposed to, mm-hmm. and then you don't like what you're doing, or you mm-hmm. decide that you want to go in a totally different direction. Um, so that's, you know, I think really starting those conversations too early on yeah. are are really important because work is a big part of our lives. Education, again, a big part of our lives. Yes. And one approach to getting to passions that we're unpacking this year in my micro school is what world issue breaks your heart? You know, mm-hmm. if the polluted oceans and um, it, sea life becoming extinct breaks your heart, if hunger in Africa, if um, unspayed animals that are, you know, running wild in your neighborhood, you know, um, what, what bothers you? And then what strengths do you have? And then how can you meld those? You know, what are you good at? What, what are you, you know, what are you passionate about? I might be good at math, but that I'm passionate about figuring out how to help animals, animal treatment and, and care. And then that's a world issue. How can I put that together? They call it ikigai in Japan, but how do you create the, the combination that makes you, like you tell your sons, want to jump out of bed and go for it every day. So we mm-hmm. need to explore those with them. And if not at the school, at summer camps, after school programs, how do they get to figure out what am I passionate about, good at, and where can I put that together? And how might that lead to a a lifelong journey, a career? Ah, that is so important. Well, we have talked about so many good things (laughs) today. I, I know that our watchers and listeners are taking so much information with them. And again, get the t-shirt. I seriously think we're already, we just met a few times and we're fast friends already. We have such (laughs) similar ideas about things. So, you know, who says, Mm -hmm. right. According to who, Mm -hmm. right. I mean, any of those kinds of questions, I think really opens us up to creativity and flexibility and understanding and listening more about what our children need that they do not fit in a box. And I don't think we should shove them in there. No, no, they are beautiful hexagons and (laughs) triangles. Come on, guys, let's let them be stars and, and circles and all kinds of awesome shapes. So good. Now, I know a lot of the watchers and listeners are going to want to learn more about you. So how do they do that? The easiest is to go to educationevolution.org. They could also go to lead-prep.org and just kind of take a peek at our school and some of the stuff that we do. But I would love to be connected and and just to be supportive of any parents or educators that are going, says who? And (laughs) (laughs) want somebody to ponder with. (laughs) I love that. And thank you for opening that door. We have, I have to say, such a lovely audience of the autism ADHD podcast, the most fabulous people that you'll find anywhere, just saying. Um, So I'm sure that those, 
that our, our listening or taking away a, a yes. That's what I keep hearing my audience say, yes, this makes so much sense. Mm-hmm. And um, hopefully we'll renew their passion for wanting yes. to, to support our kids as well. So thank you so much for coming on and speaking with me today. And I hope that you come back and visit us again. Oh, Holly, thank you for the important work you do. And it was one of my parents that said, hey, you need to know about Holly. So you're getting out there. Seattle knows about you. The world knows about you. And and thank you for being an advocate for our precious youth. Thank you so much. And I am thrilled to be able to support people and, and use my experience and able to do that. And I am very thankful for, to learn from everybody I can, um, because (laughs) we are all bringing really great information to the table. Mm -hmm. So again, thanks so much. And I'll see you soon. (laughs) Thanks Holly. (laughs) Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for joining me today. Don't forget to click that subscribe button so you don't miss any future episodes. If you like this episode, please share it with someone. It may just be what they need to watch today. If you're a parent, I'd love if you came on over and joined our Facebook group, Autism ADHD Group for Parents. If you're a therapist or educator, come on over to our group, autism ADHD group for therapists and educators. You're going to find those links right down there in the notes. Thanks so much. And I can't wait to see you in the next episode. All content provided is protected under applicable copyright, patent, trademark, and other proprietary rights. All content is provided for informational and educational purposes only. No content is intended to be a substitute for professional medical or psychological diagnosis, advice, or treatment. Information provided does not create an agreement for service between Holly Blanc Moses, Crossvine Clinical Group, the interviewee, Holly Blanc Moses, LLC, and the recipient. Consult your physician regarding the applicability of any opinions or recommendations with respect to your symptoms or medical condition or the symptoms or medical condition of your family member. Children or adults who show signs of dangerous behavior toward themselves and or others should be placed immediately under the care of a qualified professional.